All right, hello everyone. Welcome uh, back to my channel. I, uh, you know, it, 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 it's been a busy week uh, thus far for me and my guest. So uh, I, I originally, I originally set this uh, show to go at six, uh, but you know, with with work schedules and commitments. Uh, sometimes things start a little bit uh, later. Let me go to my YouTube channel so I can see if this is broadcasting. And thank you to whoever uh, gave me that like before the stream started. Yep, there's the live icon. There's uh, Sean's book cover and there's Sean's picture. All right. And oh, there's an ad. So we are live. So I am going to uh, play my, my short, short intro, and then I'm going to say a few words, and then I'm going to bring up uh, Dr. Uh, Sean Nelms, and we're going to talk about his book and uh, some other things with the time that we have. So I'll see you on the other side. Please smash that like button. Uh, the likes are free, and they help with the engagement. If you are new, please consider subscribing to the channel as well. If you want to donate something during tonight's discussion, the Super Chat is live. And my Cash App and PayPal are here. And of course, you can always uh, leave a super thanks if you watch the playback of this discussion. All right, I'll see you on the other side. Because of where I come from, see, in this world, we're all living in, in different worlds. And not everybody is privy to the same information. Well, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for uh, this second discussion on this uh, controversial but important uh, topic. Do either of you have any uh, parting words? Um, I do. And it's just thank you for having us. I really appreciate it. You ask questions in such a way that I don't know what your perspective is. I think as a host, that's exactly perfect. It's difficult, but you get more on the table from guests if you're not the story. And I really, really appreciate talking to you. All right. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Anwar. Because of where I come from, see, in this world, we're all living in, in different worlds, and not everybody is privy to the same information. All right, everyone. Yeah, that was that that short intro. That was my discussion with uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Davies and James Harrigan from the Words and Numbers podcast. And they paid me uh, one of the best compliments that one could ever uh, get when doing something like this. And that's that you ask good questions and we never know where you're coming from. So everyone, so uh, welcome back to Big Discussions 76, my original channel. There are a couple. <laughs> uh, but uh, as I've described, uh, I I wanted, I want to make this channel more of a, a podcast, more of a Q&A type thing. So tonight is one of the first uh, steps towards that vision. So I want to have on more authors and uh, more subject matter experts. And my guest tonight falls under both of those uh, umbrellas. He's a subject matter, he's a subject matter expert. Let me slow down. And he is a published uh, author, and that's something I am looking uh, to do myself. So I think earlier on, I was thinking that'll be a good jumping point, a, a good jumping off point for us, uh, me looking to become a published author. So my book, and I'm going to be really, really brief because this is about my guest and it's not about me, but this is a jumping off point. Many of you, many of my returning subscribers know about my book project, uh, The Engineers, uh, a Western New York basketball story. Uh, and it's it's a real life uh, basketball story that takes place in Buffalo uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, my the team I played on was the Hutch Tech Engineers, and there were 14 schools uh, in our league uh, called the Yale Cup. And it just so happens that I'm going to be brief here. It just so happens that my freshman year, our varsity team won the city championship in the sectional. And then as our team uh, tried to reproduce that success and as our team tried to reload, there was another team. Well, there were other teams in the league reloading and building. 
but our academic rival, <laughs> and, and me and Sean are going to talk about this as to whether or not we were their academic rival, but the other school in the league that was really, really, really known for its academics, they had a core that they were, they were building and they went on, they went on their own ascent. Uh, Dr. Sean Nelms was a part of that core. Uh, a gentleman named uh, Larry Gilbert was a part of that core. Uh, Carlos James Gant, Eric Gadley, these are all guys who were a part of that core. And just as our program was kind of uh, trying to find itself and reproduce what our 1990-91 team did, their team ascended along with one other uh, notable team. Well, a few other notable teams. But that's where I know Dr. Sean Nelms from. He's from Buffalo. Uh, and he went to our our uh, our academic rival. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and I've been following him uh, on Facebook. A lot of the Buffalo folks follow each other. You know, folks from your same city, you know who they are. And uh, I saw that he got into education. And uh, recently he just published a book called Leading with Purpose. Not leading with a purpose, leading with purpose. Uh, and so... We're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about his background a little bit, and we're going to talk about uh, uh, his book and uh, what he's doing in Rochester, New York right now. Rochester uh, is the sister city of, uh, well, I call it the sister city of Buffalo. It's an hour away, and Rochester is actually in my book as well because that's the next city over. I'm going to show something really, really quickly that I'm going to bring Sean up. I want to be respectful of his time, but I was thinking earlier about what to uh, in terms of introducing Sean, what to anchor uh, this this discussion in? I'm a blogger. I'm an aspiring author myself. This is the first piece that I ever published anywhere. This I published this on Examiner.com probably back in 2012 or 2013. Uh, and this is this story is about education because my father is a, a retired educator. And one of the, you know, my parents split when I was three. And I, I mostly spoke to my father about my, my academics over the phone. And one of the most fundamental lessons my father taught me was that academic achievement and excelling in the classroom is not due to race. Uh, it's due to uh, measurables and factors that I could control, like my focus and my time. And so keep that in mind as I bring Sean up because Sean is in, uh, he's in, ed in education, he's an, he's an administrator and he's doing something really, really cool or he's done something really, really cool at um, East High School in Rochester, New York. So keep in mind that everybody's upbringing is different. Everybody's start is different. Everybody's family is different. And likewise, when you think about education, which is a very, very important issue right now. Uh, we're, we're, headed, we're headed into an election year and our country is facing some, some major challenges. Uh, one of them is education. So as I, I'm gonna leave this below in the description box. It's a short read, but keep that in mind as I bring Sean up. Um, this is different for everybody. We, we want to, we all want to start careers and get educations and, and go on and do big things, but it's different for everybody. So with that, I'm going to minimize this, and I'm going to bring up Dr. Uh, Sean Nelms, and we're going to talk about, uh, well, our beginnings, and then we're going to talk about his book, Leading with Purpose. I have my copy here. It's got all the, all the pink post-its in it because I made notes. So here we go. Sean, how you doing? Good. Yourself? Good afternoon. Good, good evening. Evening, good evening. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the, uh, the I'm in the DMV, so we're in the same time zone. All right, good, good. Okay, well, I, uh, I yeah, I appreciate you uh, being here. I don't think we've ever formally met. I mean, we're from the same okay. city, but but Buffalo's big enough so that you know who other people are, but you may not have necessarily met them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you know it, it, it's such a small, you know, eighty five percent of the black folks in Buffalo live within the East Side, and so at some point you're gonna run into someone or someone who knows someone. And, uh, and and really be uh, drawn to them. And social media has made that made that much easier. I've been following your work and the progress you're making on your book, 
and uh, actually I can contribute a couple, you know, uh, uh, articles or comments when folks like Carlos Gant and others were commenting on your pages when you're highlighting some of the best players in Buffalo. I didn't include many to the honors folks, so you know, you get you get that critique. Um, but but no, I, I think there were so many talented kids in Buffalo. We grew up in an era where sports was definitely an opportunity for people to um, transition their lives meaningfully. We had a number of athletes during that time play at Division One, Two, II, and Three. Uh, many went on to, to do some professional, but for most of us, basketball was an opportunity for us to change our perspective and viewpoints as we um, move through life. You know, being team captains or being, you know, uh, you know, co-leads on teams, it really created and built in us the ability to have the confidence to go out and do work within Buffalo, but also uh, throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah, I mean, not not everybody goes on to the to play at, at Duke or, no, or, Mich no, or Michigan, no, no. or but but those experiences, uh, no matter how far you go with it, those are some some those can be some very formative experiences for everybody. Absolutely, yeah, and I think in Buffalo was what it was an area that was very formative. It was uh, for those who know the area well, it's had the largest Juneteenth um, experience you know in the country at the time. I believe it still does, and because and so in saying that. We were surrounded uh, with constant reminders of black excellence and ex excellence within our community. Um, and it wasn't just relegated to that one time a year. It was something that was embedded in our teaching staffs and our support staff. And so I, I just I give Buffalo a ton of credit for co-defining you know, who we were at the time, um, but also refining the person that we would eventually become in life. OK, well, so 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 tell me. Well, tell us a little bit about you because you tell a very, very. I was on the train uh, going up to I think it was uh, Montclair, New Jersey, in July, and I was reading your book. I was on Amtrak, and the first story you told in here it really hit me, and that was the story about your family uh, and your upbringing, and I think it was your mother how she had you all present your achievements as a group. And I, and I said to myself when I read that, wow, number one, me and my brother never had to do that. But number uh -huh. two, I was thinking, what was that like? Because I I, I, I don't, you know, you, you grew up in your household. You know how it right. is to be in your household, but you don't know what it's like in someone else's household. Describe your family. What was that like? It sounds like a healthy competition was encouraged early. Absolutely. Well, so I, I would say, first of all, shout out to my mom. And my brothers uh, James and, and Mike and my sister Andrea for allowing me to share those stories in the book. It was with their permission that I was able to be open and honest and transparent in certain moments throughout the text. But uh, yeah, I, I start by telling the story of how uh, my mother instilled in us very early on that you know we are going to be supportive of one another no matter what. And in competition, if it's on the athletic field or or court or if it's in the home. A healthy competition is good. And so you have to wear your um, your success on your sleeve or lack thereof. And so if you choose not to study, you choose not to get good grades, you weren't going to stay in your room and be quiet about that. But when you did the work and you performed and you excel, we we're going to celebrate that too. So it wasn't shaming. It was acknowledging the effort that you put in to achieve a certain result. And so we would, since we were young, you know, every time we had report cards, those things were on display. And so if you got a 70 or 60, which rarely happened, or an 80, we talked about it. Like, how could you get that? What are you doing? Or you had some mysterious uh, school absences that you shouldn't have because you weren't sick, you know? So those things would be on display and, and conversations would be had. And so I think fostering um, a sense of accountability academically was a life skill. You know, you you are what you put in. We would always use the word reciprocity. What you put in is what you is what you get out. Um, however, that story also continues to stay to say, despite all of that internal motivation and support, despite the countless um, opportunities to enhance our performance and to study harder and longer, the school system itself in Buffalo decided that. Myself and my two brothers are going to be on a path towards excellence because we attended a magnet school that was uh, an academic powerhouse. Um, and then my sister attended a traditional public school. And she went there because 
the district touted the school as the lead in business and that kids who attended the school was going to be prepared to, to do amazing work in, in the business industry. But when my sister, who's a junior in high school, came home and opened her textbook and noticed that my brother in eighth grade at the same time was opening his textbook, it was the first real example of inequities being um, a decision point for families and two families. And so, and so that was one of those moments early on that I realized, yes, people can talk about you know bootstrapping. If you work hard, you're gonna be successful. If you don't work hard, you're not gonna be successful. But you gotta have that conversation in the context of the system already determining for you what your success is going to be. And so once we realized that my sister was in a inferior school, not because of her intelligence, not because of her work ethic, not because of her parents valuing education, but because the system had determined it was going to sort and select certain kids, we were then able to prepare for that. Later, she went on to um, University of Buffalo. She got a master's. She's now a, a school administrator doing amazing work, graduated top of her class in high school and in college. But we had to understand that she was. we were in a game and it, we had and there was a new set of rules once we realized that she was being undertaught and underserved in the same school system as her uh, three brothers. And so I start with that story because it frames for me the realities of school and the inequities that exist. But more importantly, the book is about leadership. School is a part of the context, but that leaders can make critical decisions that harm individuals or that promote their individual abilities, talents, and treasures. And so I make the argument that leadership is the only way to scale up and to transform systems. And that you have to have leaders who believe in a collective mindset focused on on, um, on coherence of the organization, uh, focused on distributed leadership and building capacity in, uh, in its members. And, that, and that's really a critical point of the book and where we focus a lot of our attention and, and direction and getting people to think about. And I hope that resonated for you in that text. Okay. Yeah. So, so we're going to, we're going to um, come back to the book uh, and distributed, distributed lens and distributed leadership. Cause like that, that, that's a theme you, you, that goes throughout the book. Uh, but I, I want to go back. What, so that there were three of you, there were three boys and one girl. Yep, exactly. Yep. I, uh, the boys were four years apart. Wow. So again, my, when my, uh, when my sister was a junior, I was a senior in high school. So we were still, um, comparing grades at that time. My older brother had moved on. And so I was in, in 12, my younger brother was an eighth and my sister was a junior. Okay. So I've never thought about the school system making choices for you. I never looked at it like that. So I know that, um, I, I I don't know which 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 you said you went to a magnet school or, or you, you went City to Honors, a City Honors was a magnet school. Even as an elementary school, we went to a community school that was a multicultural institute, which was a feeder pattern in the City Honors. And I mentioned that because the, the 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 school that we attended was a neighborhood school. Yep. We just happened to live in that neighborhood. It wasn't as if my mom said we're going to live in this neighborhood because the feeder school is school thirty nine and thirty nine is a feeder pattern into City Honors, the highest performing school in the nation at that time. We happened to be in a community that had that school as its feeder and then happened to be prepared by our teachers because they understood the importance of preparing these kids to get into this, this school, City Honors. And, and quite frankly, if at that time, the only schools that were really academically focused in powerhouses was City Honors and Hush Tech, the school that you attended. So it doesn't surprise me that people at City Honors and Hush Tech did not realize the inequities or the systemic structures in place because we benefited from them, mm -hmm. right? So, so we didn't have. I mean, I, so the honors I know when, when when you got to eighth grade, if kids weren't performing well academically, the school counseled them out, and those kids went to other schools where I mean, you, you would see literally and predominantly black men, you would see them leave the school setting, and you would see new kids come in. You can imagine the type of schools that came in and took those kids' place. It's something that you saw all around you. You didn't understand it systemically because you really, we didn't, it, we're just in the moment. But those kids were counseled out and then told, their parents were told this might not be the best place for you. And, and so they couldn't kick them out. But if a parent opted to leave, then it could open those spots up for 
and mostly um, for well-to-do families um, in, in Buffalo that did not reflect the demographics of Buffalo. I'll yeah, so, like that. so for everyone watching who, who's not from Buffalo, yeah. City Honors, when I look back at it, when I when I was writing my book and interviewing some of the some of my classmates and 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 so on, think of a small liberal arts college. <laughs> No, it, right there, it, it right there in the middle of the city, and 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 mean means some of my classmates, we we we've talked about this. That I mean, Hutch Tech had uh, the rep had a reputation, but when we look back, City Honors was elite. So that so it was it was two different worlds. But Hutch Tech also represented racially; it was more balanced than City Honors was. Okay. So there were many more black and brown kids at Hutch Tech um, and and because the engineering track and some of those things. City Honors was really, a, it was it was a college preparatory high school. And so, uh, and it was, you had to take an exam to get in. And so that, that exam automatically sort and selected the kids who were going to be on this track. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, listen, I'm, I'm not here to criticize the school system. I will tell you that because of that education, I'm certain it allowed me to be successful as an undergrad, as a master's, as a doctoral student. I mean, I, there are things that I would I can recall in college that I learned in high school that was the building block. So I don't want to say that the school system for City Honors was bad, but it was inequitable. We can't I can't argue that. And and so what I want to commit myself to doing is creating schools that are of excellence that don't eliminate certain individuals from being within the fabric of that school setting. And so that's why I dedicated the last 26 years of my life in education um, doing is trying to make sure that we create additional pathways and opportunities for students who look like myself and my siblings, uh, but more importantly for all kids who want to, who are, who are marginalized because of how much money their parents make or language barrier or perceived language barrier. Um, or by race, whatever those whatever those areas are that that sort of select individuals. I want to make sure that we create an inclusive environment where kids can thrive based on their individual skills and talents. And why I, I said perceived um, language barriers because we know that those who speak multiple languages are the most prepared to enter the global economy. But we see that as a deficit and put these kids in ENL classes. We see kids who who are neurodiverse who think differently. Uh, we see them as different. We put them in special schools for autism and they, like we really. Our system is designed to to say if you don't fit this mold, we will look, label, sort, select you, um, and do just enough to get you through the, the finish line, but not to have you excel academically or or personally. Okay, so so really really quickly, uh, going back to Hutch Tech, I know that I remember we had an an entrance exam. I don't know if you all had that over there, but I just I remember that being the 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 line of delineation for who got in there and who didn't. You had to pass the answers exam and I think yep. you had to, uh, well, you had to show that you could do do your work, you know, yep. seventh and eighth grade, but um, I never looked at it through the lens uh, that yep. that you did. Um, okay, really, really quickly, what made you decide to get into education? I mean, again, I think the story I told earlier about my sister, I think early on, you know, we our my mom is a servant leader. She was the first, you know, mentor or leader that I see actually do the work. She was a PTA president. She was a block club president. Um, she was active in our church. And so she modeled leadership um, every single day in our lives and, that, and, and taught us that it is our responsibility to, to make our community better. She didn't say I had to be a teacher, but anything that you do professionally, you have an obligation and an opportunity to give back and to enhance the places around you. And so this particular opportunity for me was important because it allowed me to be able to use the education as a platform to help others. Um, I taught for a few years at grade eight in history. I loved U.S. history. Um, and so I, I taught that, quickly went to school administration. I was assistant principal, a principal, um, a central office um, staffer, and then a school superintendent for uh, eight years. So I worked in all aspects of the, uh, the P-12 setting but I really, really, really enjoy leading school systems in ways that provided opportunities for all children. I enjoyed that much, much more than grading test papers at the end of the day as a school teacher. Like I, I'm, I was more of a systems-oriented person, 
And, and leadership allowed me to do that and allow others to unpack their skills and talents to do this meaningful work also on behalf of students and their families in the community. Okay. So, so making a difference and, and having a positive impact Absolutely. on your community, that those were some of your major drivers. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I think, again, I, I wanted to, I mean, I saw firsthand in my own community, the, the impact in the, of people not having that direction. You know, some of the most brilliant people aren't those who went to college, you know, uh, the ones who are still brilliant without being able to, to have formal training are the ones that I, that I, that I value most, right? So I, I think when I look at my cousins and my, and my community members and those who are forced to take different pathways because the system itself gave them that, that was their only pathway, you know, I wanted to make sure it didn't happen for kids. When I got to East, our graduation rate was 29%. We were the lowest performing school in the lowest performing district in New York State. Seven years later, the graduation rate was 86%. We didn't change kids or parents. We didn't change teachers. We didn't. We changed the systems and structures, putting in a rigorous curriculum very similar to the one that I experienced at at City Honors. Having pathways for students beyond academics very similar to what you experience at Hutch Tech, and seven different pathways for kids who wanted to do something um, other than college or use those skills to go to college. You know what, Sean? It's funny you, you're saying this because earlier I was thinking it just came to me. That's that's some that's a hot topic right now. And you said you value the people who didn't go to college. Right. That's socially, that's a huge line of delineation mm -hmm. right now. Do you, so 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 talk so talk about the seven, you said the seven pathways. Do you guys yeah, encourage them to some of the students to go? Yeah, some had culinary, some information technology, some had, any vocational? Um, yeah, it was all vocational, all vocational-ish type jobs. And we had some precision manufacturing, um, uh, vision care, where the kids actually made glasses, optics, where they made uh, precision optics um, and worked in uh, final jobs and precision, precision factories around the area. Remember, this is Rochester is the city of Kodak and Xerox. So those companies, as they spun off, those jobs were, uh, were, were necessary for our community to thrive. These were high paying jobs. You know, this goes on and on. Um, and, and, the, and also direct pipelines to the University of Rochester, where I am currently. So when you think about a school setting that that only provides an opportunity like my sister went to for um, labor intensive work or a school that only prepares kids to be um, college bound, you're going to leave kids out in either setting. So I think you can have both. You can have pathways developed for students and make the academics rigorous enough, because as we all know and about you, when I got into college, I switched my major three times. So I had no idea exactly what I wanted to do when I got there, but I knew I enjoyed learning a multiple and multitude of things. And so by my junior year is when I really realized that we're, we're forcing this, the school system, I should say, often forces that junior year decision that we're forced to make in college upon kids when they enter middle school. When they say, you're gonna track into a school that is academically rigorous, or you're gonna track into a school that only prepares you to do jobs um, that are labor intensive and perhaps don't have much room for mobility um, professionally. Okay. Well, what, what resonates, what's resonating with me about what you just said is that I think one of the things that, that we're seeing, uh, we're, we're seeing a bit of, um, I don't, don't want to go too far down this road tonight, but we're seeing a bit of a, well, well, for, for a lot of households, college is the only way. College is the only, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced that uh, in your, in your, um, in your, your journey and in, in your, um, in, on, on your road for a lot of, I know in my, in my family, that was the expectation. You're going to go to college and that's it. And that's okay. Uh, but as you described, there are other sectors of our society and of the world. And I think one of the things we're seeing now is that, uh, we're seeing a bit of a, a, a gender split where there, where there are more uh, there are more girls going to college, uh, and, and and we know that boys and girls learn differently. I'm not in this arena, so I, I so I'm not an expert, but from what I'm learning, boys and girls learn differently. So what so what's what you do with all the boys who are not going to college? We we don't we don't have to go down this road tonight, but yeah yeah, but I, I don't I don't I mean I think I think people I think people in general process things differently. Um, I, I, I think that, um, you know, we'd be careful when we say 
you know, the certain, certain, certain kids are, uh, are prepared or ready for college and others are, it's more of a systemic thing. So yes, more girls are going to college, but it's not because, because more boys are, are not going necessarily. Remember college wasn't accessible to a lot of females for the last 70 years in most mm-hmm. of the college universities, a lot of professions had glass ceilings for, for women um, and, and marginalized and minoritized people. And so now that these these um, these opportunities exist, you are seeing people see college as an opportunity for them to, to, to go and to explore fields. And if you don't think that that reality has anything to do with the recent Supreme Court decision around form of action, people are missing it. The moment in which people start getting access to college and outperforming those who, who were I'm only allowed to attend, that's when the rules change. And so you are seeing a, a, a wide number of people going to college because they understand those professions that were once close to them as recent as 50, 60, 30 years ago. Now they are not only going in those professions and being successful, they are becoming the leads in those profession. And it's threatening to, to certain certain individuals. And so I would say that that if we were to have college be accessible to all, then make it be accessible to all and then let competition take place if that's what we want. Affirmative action did not advantage one population over another because you still had to get into the school and qualify. So it's not as if it, it advantaged, it just, it really even the playing field, it wasn't even even because you still have legacy admissions and things like that, but it gave an additional pathway for individuals who would have not had that pathway Otherwise, but that's a whole other conversation, a whole other hour conversation we could have. But I would say that I value having kids having a, a valued experience from pre-K to 12th grade. So whatever they choose to do after that, they're prepared to do it um, in ways that make sense to them. And so uh, if that's going, going to college, going to the military, becoming an entrepreneur, going on to work, so be it. Um, but I, don't, I have not pushed that on my kids. I mean, I tell them that what college has afforded me it has given me access to the global world. It has given me opportunity to to see and do things that I would not have done if I wouldn't had not gone to college. But I also can't say what I would have done if I didn't go to college because I went to college. But I told my son, I said, you show me how many black men are successful who had not gone on and been formally educated. Um, and and has a, and have a sustained um, a lifestyle. Yes, you can go on and play a sport, and yes, you can be a musician, but very few do it for 30, 40 years. So I say, you show me that. And and I couldn't think of very many people who were not formally trained, who had a sustained lifetime over, t- had a sustained profession over time um, that are Black men. I can tell you, because I've taught in all different geographic areas, there are a number of my former students who had parents who had businesses, they inherited grandfather's um, property, you know, and they turned that and flipped that by their own hard work. They flipped it and made them make something out of themselves. But those opportunities when you grow up in generational poverty don't exist for, for kids, for most kids, particularly those who are minoritized. So is college important? Absolutely. Should kids be prepared for that to go? Yes. Are there some kids who don't want to go, who will struggle in college? Yes. But for those kids, there are other advanced learning opportunities that don't have a university or college for its name. Trade schools are important. Uh, unionized labor is critically important. These are jobs that are going to pay you six figures, you know, over the course of your lifetime. Those jobs are equally important. We have to prepare our kids to enter both of those spaces. Okay. Because the other thing is, and I'm going to keep this short, there, there's a perception of other than college. There's, there, there's, there's the perception that college is is the, the the shiny house on the hill and that's that's it so uh okay my next question is and then we'll we're gonna get right to uh leading with with purpose talk about being a veteran of the the education system in new york state talk about the landscape today my father is a retired educator from the schenectady school district over in the capital the capital district of new york state what I'm hearing a lot about issues that the the education system in the United States uh, is facing. Uh, what what kinds of things are you seeing? I'm hearing a lot about teacher burnout. I'm hearing a lot about folks not going into the profession. Uh, what are you What are you seeing? 
or is it is it is it is that that all propaganda? No, education is tough, man. I mean, there there is uh there's def it's definitely a valuable and honorable profession. Um, I think I think a couple things happen. One is I don't know about you, but when I when I went to college, like I said, I didn't have an idea what I wanted to do. So, but I knew I loved public service. I knew teaching was an honorable profession. I knew I had unionized. I had uncles and aunts who were in unions, so I knew the importance of that. Um, and so, education was a not just a convenient pipeline, but it was a real one for me. It really allowed me to do things that were beyond what my parents were able to accomplish and ascertain. I gotta be honest, if I were going to college tomorrow and I knew what I know now, I probably would have pursued other careers because I took the same four year program as my roommate. My roommate may or may not be academically more gifted than me. We get out of college, my first contract was $31,750. Some of my closest friends who got out of college and didn't go to education signed contracts for 60. And so if you're telling your own child you're going to go to college, most educators don't encourage their kids to go into a profession where in some states they're, they have, they're teaching and receiving food stamps. Now, in New York, we're, 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 we, are, we, are, we are very uh, gifted in that we have a favorable pension Teachers can do really, really well. They have, I mean, it's not a bad profession economically here, but if I were to leave from here and go to North Carolina or to parts of uh, Midwest or some places in the South, some of those teachers top out at $60,000 a year. Like that's their last and final um, salary. And so I, as a parent, would not tell my kids to go into a profession and pay you know, seventy thousand a year at a university. You know, leave with two hundred thousand dollars in debt to go work in a profession that pays thirty thousand dollars. So the teacher shortage really is an economic one. I think teachers are making very thoughtful decisions. We have to pay our teachers more. We have to support them differently. We have to support our administrators and support and support staff more. And it has to be a funding priority for this nation. I mean, you really, you really need, to, and most countries do that. Most countries put their best and brightest individuals in the classroom, and so they and they pay them accordingly. We don't do that. I'm not saying teachers aren't the best and brightest. What I'm saying is, people who are a math major may not go into teaching. They may go become an engineer. It pays more. The math is more difficult. Some teachers will go into teaching math, and I just think we have to be. If you look at it from a historical standpoint. We look at it from a, uh, a national, international standpoint. Our model for teacher education here um, needs to be um, revisited and revamped so that the profession is what becomes one of the most honored one and that teachers, administrators, and support staff are paid accordingly. And that parents, when they send their kids off to these schools and institutions, that they know that their kids are not in a system that is sorting and selecting them um, based on their perceived ability to be successful or to be accomplished in this country. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and one of my favorite talks of his, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, mentioned that, that teachers need to be paid more because it's arguably, yeah, it's arguably the most important job in our country because you're preparing the future generations to take the country over. And if, well, uh, go ahead. No, I think well, if you pay more, I think you'll attract a different, type of um, employee, right? So again, I'm not, and this is, I'm gonna be careful because I'm not saying that our current employees aren't, aren't value or, or, or anything like that. I'm saying that it will, you will have mathematicians, people who like are math and brilliant teaching math. You will have historians, the political science majors who are brilliant thinking about teaching and, and having courses in high schools. You know, the list goes on and on. It also will force teacher preparation programs to increase the rigor in ways that when they produce teachers in college, these are the best and brightest minds. And, and listen, in the teaching profession, we know there are some college and universities that prepare the kids extremely well, teachers extremely well to enter the field. And we know there are others that don't do a really good job. You know, if it's competitive work environment, if it's a competitive labor force, it will force all parts of the system to ramp up, become more rigorous and, and give our students and families what they deserve. More importantly, give the teacher 
the ability to be successful in the classroom in ways that that we often don't see that happening, particularly in, in underserved uh, communities. Okay. I got to slip this one in. I'm watching the clock. I, I want to be mindful uh, of your time. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no. <laughs> in the NFL good. here, I'm watching the clock. I'm watching the, you know, got to get the playoff in time. Um, the 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 black male uh, shortage, the shortage of black male teachers, is that just there are fewer going into the pipeline or is there something else happening? We're not, we're not graduating enough black males in high school. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, you know, if we don't, gra- I mean, again, when I came to East, which is which was a you know, uh, it wasn't a very diverse. It was almost all black and brown. Our graduation rate was twenty nine percent, and most of our graduates were, were female. So if you just look at East as a microcosm of what happened, what could happen in a school setting, if they don't graduate high school, they're not going to be successful in college, and they never will become become teachers. So the school system, this all starts within. I keep saying a sorting and selecting process in schools, right? You you have to have a educated uh, 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 base of students exiting high school, so you can have, and then, then college has to be accessible and affordable to all Americans, and then you have individuals graduating and entering different professions. So there's a natural gate set up when we don't educate black men in ways that allow them to graduate and be successful. We see that across the country, right? Um, you know, I, I saw recently that you know there are three thousand four-year institutions in this country. 101 of them are HBCUs, all right? 101 to 3,000. That 101 produces, I think, 26% or 20% of all Black graduates. So the vast majority of graduates or large portion, you look at, you know, ratios, happen within the HBCUs. And that's why they were so important. So the question has to be, if we're not graduating kids in high school, and even if we do, why aren't kids persisting, meaning they're moving from, from, from the first year of college to the second year of college? And if not, and, and of those who persist, how many are actually graduating who are black men? That data is more telling for why we don't see, we don't have a, a large number of, of black men in this profession. And of those black men, if you make it through those thresholds and all those gates that are put up before you, are you going to enter a profession where you have I think, the, I think only 3% of, of teachers in the country are black men. You can check that data. I think that's right. Um, are they going to enter a profession that's going to pay them half if they if they went to a different, a different profession? So now when you become this very small number of college graduates, you have different opportunities. And you have to, and they're making a, 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 a business decision at that point. And so I think the conversation around teacher shortage, around uh, black male teacher shortage, if it's not contextualized in the systemic issues they have to face to get to graduation of high school and then of college, then it seems like people just aren't going into teaching. No, we have options. We have opportunities. And for those of us who chose the field, I applaud you. I mean, I, I love every bit of my career. But I also realized later in life how different life could have been for me and my family. How I chose a different career that was equally as rewarding, but perhaps more lucrative. I, I realized that Teachers are leaving the profession because after 10 years, you're like, man, 10 years, I'm making $50,000 in some states or $40,000 in other states. Why am I working so hard to make so little? And then you're getting bashed for CRT and all the other, you know, um, you know, anti-black, uh, you know, rhetoric in, in the country. So you really have an opportunity to think about different opportunities. I think all those things combined um, describe this work. However, I will say for those men who are considering education or people who are considering education, I would say do it. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful profession. You learn a ton, you connect with kids and families, but you have to go into it knowing um, the, the economic and financial outcomes of that work. You have to go into it understanding that it's not just showing up and, and entertaining kids for 60 minutes. It's a comprehensive space. hmm Okay, well, well, Sean, um, and we're going to move on to leading with purpose right now. Uh, but, but I, I know that uh, again, having lived with my father in the latter stages of his uh, career as an educator, I know that uh, it depends on which district you're in as well. So I know some districts are nicer 
well, we're, we're going to talk about that with East, but some districts are, are, are probably, see, I don't want to say nicer, but I know that in some districts there's more parent involvement and, and one of my dad's, uh, uh, one, one of his experiences that he told me about was he, he, he wasn't sure that the parents were help were kind of helping the parent, helping the kids out, helping the teachers out in terms of doing the homework and, 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 and making sure the kids do what they're supposed to do when they went home. So I think what I'm observe what I'm observing is that it depends on a lot depends on which district you're in as well. Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah. Maybe? I mean, I think, yes, I, I think, you know, so in Rochester City School District, I just use that example. That's that's the, my current context, or wasn't the current context. So mm -hmm. when you have a system that did not graduate grandparents and parents, I still had kids who were first high school first time high school graduates in their family, graduating in the last three years. First, the first kid in their family graduated, and their families were have been here for decades. And so when you ask about parental engagement, you have we have to ask ourselves. Are those parents disengaging because they don't want to their kids to be successful or because they've experienced a life of success in the same system that their kids are in? Our kids don't have a choice. Our parents don't have a choice but to go to city schools in this area because they can't afford to go in other areas that are that are better resourced. Right. So the schools are different because economically they've been they've been divided. You know, and, and and people move to suburban communities. It's not always for safety because you could be safe in an urban setting. A lot of times they move to these communities because they understand the schooling system. They understand what education affords and the opportunity that, that may be there. It doesn't mean that the teaching in the suburban schools are better than the teaching in the city schools. It's that in suburban schools, you have more consistency with your school boards and your superintendents. You have um, so people are there long and long enough to create some some motivation and some systemic um, uh, responses to things. In urban schools, the superintendents, I think the average superintendent is two and a half years of tenure in, in, in large urban settings. So you have constant turnover and chaos in some of those some of those spaces, not all, but, but, but many. And so the school district can define the culture, but it's the district that I emphasize, not the people in it. So I, I, I think that, you know, not every parent is great in suburban. Not every parent is bad in suburban. Same goes for rural or, or urban. What I will say is the school systems that are designed for all kids to be successful are the ones where all kids have the best chance of being successful. Even in your most prominent suburban districts, there are kids and kids by um uh, kids as defined by different categories. It could be special ed, it could be ENL, it could be black men, it could be black females who haven't done well historically. And But because the graduation rate is 90 or 95%, everyone says, hey, we're doing well. And so they actually disaggregate their data and see that this same cohort of kids or subgroup of kids have constantly performed, underperformed in our district. You can't convince me that's because of the kids. If the system has allowed that to happen, um, you know, uh, allow the district to be successful at the expense of those kids not being successful. So, you know, I have a lot to say about that, but but I, but I do think that there are there are ways which we have to re-engage parents in ways that give them uh, um, optimism and faith that the school system is going to be designed for them. We have to design school systems in ways that uh, give some credibility to the work that we're doing. And we can't we can't ignore the fact that much of what we see not happening is a direct um, response or correlation to things that we have not done as a society. OK, I was thinking about uh, Jonathan Kozal's uh, savage inequalities when you talked about uh, the economic conditions where, you know, these particular families live and where these particular schools are. OK, I want to uh, respect your time. So. We're gonna jump into the into the book. Go for it. Uh, and and whatever else we don't get to, maybe you, you can come back or I'll squeeze it in at the end. So, uh, leading with purpose. So, I think this is a fitting question. This question is actually reversed here in my Microsoft Word document. But mm -hmm. since you talked about East High School, the book is is based around East High School. 
tell us about East High School, what it was like when you got there. I know about its rich basketball history. <laughs> but in Buffalo, you had Hutch Tech and City Honors, and then you had, you know, Performing Arts, and then you kind of had everybody else. And yet there were a few yeah. schools at the bottom. What what was East High School like in Rochester? East High was a, was a, was the worst school in the state. The worst the school in the state? Yeah. It was, a low, it was the lowest performing school in the lowest performing district in New York State. To me, that qualifies to be the worst school in the state. And let me be clear, it wasn't worse because the kids were bad or teachers were horrible or or parents didn't care. It was worse because the system was given exactly, the system was designed to get the results it was getting. And it was to push kids out the door. And uh, it, 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 was, it was a mess. Like there was no structure there. And teachers were left to do things on their own. Kids were left to survive. I love Bettina Loves. Um, uh, construct around moving from survival to thriving. Uh, she just, a uh, shout out to her, she just uh, uh, wrote a book um, called uh, Punished for Dreaming. Uh, really good book, I just finished it. Uh, another book she has also called We, 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 we Can Do More. But but I would say that, that is she, why I mentioned her is that she was a Rochester kid who's now a professor in Georgia, doing a lot of work in this space. And she uses Rochester as her context and talking about the things that she went through in that system and now as a you know 40 40 plus year old woman still is trying to recover from that type of education neglect um that that she endured she actually calls a spirit murdering how we spirit murder wow. students so i would say east was a place where those things happened and the only reason why east turned itself around and moved from that 29 percent to 86 percent is because we authentically engaged the parents the kids the teachers the support staff the administrators the community members to say, what school do you want? How can we design it? And then what is your commitment to making sure that we that we meet um, our intended goal, our collective intended goal? So that was East. And, and I and I share that this is not one of those lean on me moments where I came in with a bat and or you know, none of that. That wasn't, that wasn't it. There was no yeah. savior, no, no theme coolio that had come out the back singing, you know, rapping a song, you know, it wasn't that. This was a community-wide effort. And, and there, there is a, an African proverb that says there's nothing for us without us. And so the, we really focused on the, on, on the with us and helped to co-define and co-construct. And my job as superintendent and as a professor was to make sure that I buffer the school's transformation from the outside noise. And I had to take all the arrows for that, which is fine. I had a big back, right? Take all the arrows for that. I wanted them to focus on teaching on curriculum, student development, finding let students find their voice, parental engagement, and all of our measures from having one parent on PTA when we first got there to over 50 engaged in our um, in our in our family community engagement structure, you know, from a graduation rate from 29 to 86, from our kids coming in 1% reading at grade level and and 2% meeting proficiency in math in middle school, all those numbers moved. And it was a University of Rochester's project. It wasn't just a school of education. And so we had every aspect of the university involved in this process. From the dental school, there's a dental lab on campus now where they're doing cleaning teeth and, and doing oral exams right on campus. We produce eyeglasses. Our kid, our students make a thousand pairs of eyeglasses for kids at East and kids throughout the region yearly in their in their vision care program. We have um, a number of resources from barber shops to mental health, to uh, we have a thrift store in there. Kids go thrifting with donated clothes so you look good. You know, Dion says, you know, you look good, you play good. When you play good, they pay good, right? So, so when you're talking about educating the entire child and, and, and supporting the entire community, that's what schools are supposed to be. That was the whole idea around neighborhood schools before Reaganomics destroyed them, is that you're going to center the work around the people they co-define it, and then they hold people accountable to what they define as their uh, their their desired outcomes. Not the other way around. Not the outside coming in telling them what to do and how to do it. Okay, uh, we're at about we're almost at fifty five minutes. I want to be respectful yeah. of your time. Uh, we, we 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 go five more. Let's go five more. If you, if all right, all right, all right, all right. Cool. So. How did you so so one of the, the first terms you introduce in the book is the EPO, the Educational Partnership Organization. How did you all decide to choose East for this project? East chose the university. 
Oh. So, uh, yeah, so it, it's interesting. The University of Rochester does not have an undergraduate program. So really, we weren't the ideal place for them to start because we have a graduate program. So we produce a number of school administrators, uh, scientists, sci teachers of science, math, you know, at a very high, very rigorous level, what I referenced earlier. This, the state was going to shut these down. You had five options, turn into a charter, close it down completely, meaning close the doors, board it up. Um, they had, you can remove half the kids and, um, and then, and teachers and put another group of kids and students in that makes no sense conceptually, but it was tried a few times and all those schools failed. Um, you had another opportunity to give it over to the state um, university of New York. SUNY doesn't, that's not the work they do and, or to create what they call a receivership. And the receivership is that someone comes in and assumes responsibility for the school. And that was the university of Rochester. And so we were approached by the school board president to take over this school. The university, quite honestly, was like, ah, this ain't for us. Three times. We're not sure we want to do this. And finally, the president of the university said, you know, if not us, then who? You know, and, and, and really, really champion that work with the board of trustees and, and the school of education and the rest of the campus to say, this is what we have to do. If we're going to be an anchor institution. We have to do this work. Honestly, the results of our work, and I explained it to you already tonight, was how I got um, recruited to become the next vice president of the university for community partnerships. And so my new job is to create not just an education, but all aspects of the university, these authentic partnerships that expand our research opportunities, that expand, expand our community partnerships. Um, and so taking our work from the university out into the out into the community, but more importantly, having the community inform where our work at the university is going to be. We're doing this at a local level. We're going to scale it to national, international level. And so we define community because universities have many communities, internal, external, local, national, regional, international. Um, that's the work I'm, I'm going to be doing because we know if we truly engage the community in meaningful ways, we can elevate all types of research. We can elevate our engagement with our hospital and the community. The list goes on and on and on. So if we truly embrace that, nothing for us without us, and we apply that to a higher ed or post-secondary um, construct, think about the endless opportunities that, that could exist. And that's the work that we're going to do moving forward. And it's the work that we've already continued, um, and that we, we started and we're going to continue. OK. So the principle of, I mean, in the book, you talk a lot about leadership. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me was the the vision and the values shouldn't leave when the person on top leaves. Yeah, that yeah. That, that stood out to me. But also the theme of uh, distributed distributed lens. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about that principle of what why why you took that theme throughout the entire book? A yeah. distributed lens, a distributed vision. What what is what does that mean? Yeah, so distributed leadership essentially is leadership. the notion that there is no single heroic figure in a successful organization. That is the collective parts of everyone and, and that you have to develop a system in which people own the success and failure of the organization equally. Uh, I call it interpersonal accountability. I got that from a guy named Dennis Sparks. Um, and, so, and so we use that idea, of that construct to really think about how you move all aspects of the organization. First, you have to build capacity in individuals and they build it in you as well as bi-directional. So you're gonna all get smarter about the work. And then once you're smarter about the work, you're able to then distribute the responsibility for people to do it. And leadership, you know, you we, I, we often say you can delegate responsibility, but not accountability. Ultimately, I know it's my responsibility and accountability to do this work. I'm gonna want to lose their job, you know, if it doesn't work. But if people also feel a sense of ownership through success and a failure, they'll, they'll work and act differently. And I should also note that, you know, this concept was actually the framework of my dissertation. So I was able to take my dissertation and actually apply much of that, um, much of that, um, that framework to this school setting. And that's why the book talks about school leadership in the beginning, because I think education is the perfect context because it's so complex. That's just the first two or three chapters. The rest of the book is really about leadership and how these lessons that I learned throughout my 26 years of of being in schools made me think differently about how I engage with individuals, how I take ownership and, and, and demonstrate humility, how I empower others to take the work and innovate, um, but also 
um, when it's time to, to transition out. And uh, I think Gandhi said it best, he gets credit for it. He says, there go my people, I must follow them for I am their leader. The moment in which you are part of the organization and just part of the system, it's time to pass it on. And I think succession planning for me was important. I just met with the superintendent who's there this morning, our weekly meeting, and, and she's loving it because she was a former principal. So now she gets to see her work in a different lens from a 30,000 foot view and reap the benefits of how she trained her replacement who was assistant principal in the building previously. And so I think that's leadership. Leadership is, is the transfers, the transference of not just you know folders and documents and a hard drive, but it's knowledge, skills, and accountability. And, and, and that's what the book talks about in the chapter around succession planning. Okay. So in other words, uh, th those positions aren't meant to be occupied by the same person forever. I need people to stretch and grow and do something because I want them to innovate. I want them to model innovation so that whoever they're leading um, can be acknowledged for their hard work. And they'll, and they'll in turn have someone else model innovation and you can have this continuous cycle of leadership that's anchored into a common vision or a common purpose in the book we call it moral purpose. Um, and the purpose is what's defined by the organization that's gonna drive its actions, relationships and um, uh, further. Okay, so d does this mean that in every school system, the, 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 the thought process is not to train successors, it's to uh, you know, to to to, to create a, a a little fiefdom for the person on the top. Is no, that we don't want to, you don't want to do that. I mean, those systems fail because when the person leaves, if it's, if it's a sudden departure, death, or something that's planned, right? Then the system is in chaos. It spins, and so I would say that the system divide should define the culture of the building, not the individual. Individuals can be replaced when I'm gone. The systems that are in place are going to continue because they were co-constructed with the individuals within. So yes, I might add my own flavor as a leader. Maybe I get credit for my leadership style working at certain times. But at the end of the day, if I leave and the system crumbles, then I did a horrible job as a leader. And I think that applies in any organization um, that you're in, education, was for me, but now at the higher ed, it's a different form of education. It's in business. Some of my largest clients are not educators. Banking industry, um, other private uh, equity firms. I've done things with uh, in food service. I've done things with non-for-profits because they understand that education is where you see the most complex issues occur between kids, adults, kids and adults, outside influence, state and federal policies. And if you can get that right, then I think you can get any any organization right in terms of developing a leadership structure that works. Okay, we're gonna wrap up uh, right now. But okay, so what I hear you saying is is that this is a framework that uh, education shouldn't just embrace. All organizations should embrace this type of thinking. Yes. Yep. I think uh, you. I think we have to empower others to create lasting change. That's the second part of that book of that title. I think we want to empower others to create lasting change and lasting change will only occur if the if the direction and the drive of the organization is commonly known, shared, created and understood. OK, so, Sean, do you do you have any parting words? I mean, I know you have a uh, you have a consulting group. Is, is that? Yeah, no, yeah, I have a consulting group. Yeah, it's um, that the book is found on, on Amazon. I encourage you to go there and, and buy the book and leave a comment if you if you buy and purchase and, um, and enjoy it, because I think it's important feedback for me, but also for others uh, seeking that book. It's on, get on Amazon. Um, and then I have a consulting group as well. And that information is in the book, but it's also the now consulting group, uh, com. Okay. I'm going to end, uh, I'm going to end this with a quote from the book. Uh, it's a proverb. Uh, uh, a child who was not embraced by it will burn down the village to feel its uh, warmth. So I've heard that before, but you 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 captured that in, in the book as well. Uh, and then the other one you kept mentioning was celebrating our incompetence. So I think that was a um, uh, uh, I, I guess at East that was a, a, a 
a, a quote you, you all use to, to keep innovating yeah. and to keep pressing on and to keep striving every day. Yeah, if, 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 if the lead, senior leadership team is not modeling uh, being incompetent in, in an effort to be smarter and better about the work, then the people they manage won't, the teachers won't, and then students won't. And so we, we create a, a stagnation within our school for innovation and creativity. When you, when you celebrate your incompetence, to me, it's a nod to folks being able and encouraged to fail forward um, and, and to try and do new things. So that that that's what that's what we uh, that we embrace and it, and it worked for us. And I think with the right construct and context, it can happen in any organization. But I will say also I also say this: if you don't show any love to City Honors in your upcoming book, we're gonna have a problem. All right, we're gonna have a hey, problem because, hey. because we had we had some 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 players out there. People went on and played Division One, people who broke records. Um, and and we ran things from for about four years, and I think that I think that that and, and it's funny. I, I say why city honors was so important during that time is that we were the school that was considered the other. Yes, and we didn't have talent, and we were the little nerdy kids, and so the criticism that we endured, and 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 what we changed in terms of the face of that that kids, particularly kids of color, can be scholar athletes, I think was the biggest um, impact that we made during those years at City Honors. That we had the respect as scholars and we also had the, the respect as athletes. And I don't think any other school in the system during that time, arguably Hutch Tech as well, which I, I, I weren't that good. But, <laughs> but I would say, I would say that um, no other school could, could claim that and go out and beat suburban schools, rural schools, and city schools um, by being physically physically gifted on the court, but also um, uh, smart and, and how, how we played the game. And I think that is a part of the story that people don't always grasp, that that was that challenge. It was, I mean, listen, we could have re recruited, you know, some of the best and brightest kids and put them all in school where they can perform, but almost every kid on that team went to college, graduated, and are pursuing their dreams. And I think that's a story that needs to be told. Okay. Well, I, 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 that's, 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 a that's, that's, that's a shameless plug. That, that could be in Hey, hey <laughs> I, I had a nice long talk talk with uh, Carlos James Gant, and he told me about Romeo McKinney, and he told me about <laughs> Coach Fran, and, yeah. and, and the Portville game, and everything. Yeah. But yeah. I, I'll tell you this, because uh, I know we have to wrap up. Um, my, junior, my junior season was a rough season over at Hutch Tech for all of us. And I think that one of the games that really helped, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. <laughs> one of the games that really broke our team was the loss to you guys. Mm -hmm. And I still remember that play. I was on the bench watching. Uh -huh. I, was, I was injured most of that year, but, but you, you got an offensive rebound. One of our big guys reached out and slapped your elbow and you, you, you put the ball back in the basket, got the and one. And I remember that play permanently shifted the momentum of that game. And, and so, yeah, you guys, yeah, I watched you guys ascend and uh, yeah. Yeah. City honors. You guys had a squad. You know, what's funny about this. I, I said, this, I have to go to, um, I don't remember. I don't remember very much in my high school basketball career. I, I just, I'm one of those people. Once it's out, it's gone. I'm yeah. on to the next thing. I wish I could go back and, and relive those days. I mean, James, he's like a, he's like, <laughs> he remembers every play. Um, I don't, don't even remember that play. I just remember being able to walk the streets of Buffalo with pride because we were no longer the geeky kids or the other kids. And I grew up in the heart of the Buffalo. So I didn't always get that because people knew my family and they knew stuff. But I always felt a, a sort of embarrassment. Um, by playing ball at CRs because we were we used to get smashed all the time. And so we actually, I really think that that is our biggest contribution, regardless of sectional titles and individual accomplishments, is that we redefine four kids in that community that you can be a scholar and an athlete and, and be and do great at both. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, Sean, right. I appreciate you coming Thank on. You. Everybody, the, the book is uh, Leading with Purpose. Uh, it's not just about education. As I learned uh, tonight, there's a lot in here for everybody. So, uh, yeah, pick up a copy leading with purpose. Thank you so much. Okay, sir.
All right. All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and end the, and uh, wind uh, the stream down. It's getting late. I have to go into my uh, place of business tomorrow and uh, make the donuts, as they say. No, I'm not actually making the donuts. I'm making something else. But yeah, this is this is the future of the channel. Uh, interviews and discussions with other authors and uh, subject matter experts. So I hoped, uh, I hope you all got something out of this. And uh, I hope you all watching on the playback, whoever watches on the playback, I hope you get something out of this as well. Uh, this is Big Discussions uh, 76, my original channel. This is Big Discussions 76, my original channel. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Anwar Yusuf Dunbar. Uh, if you're new, please like, share, and subscribe. If you're a returning subscriber, please like and share. Please share this content out. That is very, very valuable uh, for me and the channel. If you want to donate something to the channel, my Cash App and PayPal are below in the description box. Uh, and if you watch this, if you watch this on the playback and something resonates with you, you can also leave a super thanks. Uh, I am a writer and a blogger and soon to be author. So please consider joining uh, the Big Words LLC newsletter. There is a uh, two paragraph uh, greeting. There is a two paragraph greeting, and then you just uh, scroll down and uh, smash that subscribe button at the bottom, and you enter in your email address there, and you are part of my group. I promise I will not give your information away. Uh, I know how uh, dangerous that is. I mentioned my father during the stream, and uh, people don't like being put on lists that they don't want to be put on. So. I won't do it. So with that, everyone, uh, hey, enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you to those of you who watched and those of you, those of you who commented uh, during the stream. Again, if you're watching on the playback, please let me know what you think in the comment section below. And I'm going to wrap this up, everyone. As always, remember that your attitude determines your altitude. Always try to do your best. Uh, take care, and I will talk to you the next time. I have other guests. Uh, on the way, I have someone that I have invited, well, two people that I've invited, and uh, they have agreed to come on. I need to uh, do more reading. So, yeah, more guests, more more talks with uh, subject matter experts. So I will talk to you next time. And in between those talks with subject matter experts, there will be more thought pieces. So, all right, everyone with that, uh, yeah, have a good night and I will talk to you uh, the next time. Bye-bye.